All right, welcome. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Wow, that is just pathetic. Just kidding. Glad that you're here. We're really glad that you that you're uh, that you're here this morning, worshiping with us. Um, there's a, a little announcement bulletin that we have, and then there's also prayer lists in there with the sermon kind of stuff on the back uh, to take notes. And we just invite you to take that prayer list home and pray through those people that are struggling in our lives and in our community. Um, this bulletin is really uh, here. It's also online. Uh, there's, it's Rolodexing through. Um, it's really an opportunity for you to figure out how you can be fed, because there's two important parts of faith, being fed and then stepping out and serving. And so there's two different opportunities in faith here, to be fed in faith and to step out and serve in faith that you'll find in here. Um, you might have seen the Financial Peace Universities coming up uh, that uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah and Taylor Hughesby are doing after, um, after Easter. So if you'd like to be a part of Financial Peace University, there's a little bit of a cost, but we can help cover that if you need help. Uh, so we just want uh, people to to be able to, to go to that and not feel uh, overwhelmed. And so uh, that's an opportunity coming up. There's all kinds of stuff going on in here, but one of the things I just want to lift up is Holy Week calendar. Next week is Palm Sunday. And then we're in Holy Week, and uh, you'll see all of those opportunities, places, and times where you can worship with us and move with us from Palm Sunday to Monday Thursday when Jesus does the Last Supper and Good Friday and the crucifixion and the resurrection. And I know you'll be really blessed. We just invite you to those services. I know our Good Friday service is always just packed, and it's just an, an awesome worship. So I invite you to come along. You'll notice, though, Easter Sunday, 6.30, 8.30, 10.30 worship. 8.30, 10.30, 6.30, 8.30, 10.30 worship. How are you? I don't know about you, uh, what it's like at your house. If you live in town, it's probably a little easier up at our farm. Uh, to get to our house, um, it's a little bit of a chore. Um, four-wheel drive, that's right, Lisa. We pop that thing, or else we just pop the clutch and go. You know, you just go and you just hope you make it through. Skittle across that path, you know. Um, but it's muddy. It's muddy. And it's deep. And you can get kind of stuck. Well, I don't know where you're at in life. Maybe you're at a place where you're feeling like you're just barely trudging through, or maybe you're stuck or you're overwhelmed, or you just feel kind of gross about what's going on. I'm really glad that you're here. We don't have four-wheel drive. We don't need that. But we do need a Lord, a living Lord, who promises to show up when two or three are gathered, when we open up Scripture, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, promises to meet you where you are and to minister to your heart. Amen? Isn't that an awesome promise? So we're claiming that this morning for each of you, for all of us, as we worship together. And so let, let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for an opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together the ways, Lord, that your Spirit your spirit gathers us, Lord, the way that your spirit pours itself out, that you pour your spirit into our lives and into our worship, Father, that you meet us, Lord, and that you minister to our hearts and our minds, Father. We just trust those promises, and we're thankful, Father, for your word that's alive, that goes to work on our hearts and our minds, and we pray, Father, that you would do that this morning. We trust it. We pray for an outpouring of your spirit in our lives, in this place, in Jesus' name, and all God's people say... Voices of 
I've got a dog that likes to go in the mud. In fact, if this dog can find manure, that's even better. That's even better. So as you can imagine, this dog doesn't spend a lot of time in our home. Because for this dog to be in our home, we would have to wash it numerous times a day. It just can't come in. Well, I don't know about you in, in, in your life, but we can get ourselves into messy places, can't we? And our lives can be kind of a muddy muck of a mess of sin and brokenness. But we have a God who in John 14 says, I want you where I am. I want you in, I want you in the house with me. And so he provides a washing. He's living water. He provides forgiveness and new life. And so we can bring our muddy selves, our mucked up lives, and we can bring them before this awesome God who will wash and cleanse us every time. My little dog, my dog doesn't get washed. I draw a line. Jesus doesn't draw the line. He wants you. He wants you to come. He wants to cleanse you up and bring you in. And so we just take time every time we come together to worship just to simply do that, to simply unload, to kind of ask for forgiveness, to lay our brokenness and our sin and our uncertainties and our doubt and to lay them in the arms of the living water, Jesus Christ. And so let's take time just to do that right now. Oh, he loves the sound of your voice. Even as you lift up your brokenness and your sin, he loves to pour out water. And he speaks this into your life this morning. My child, my child, why are you striving? You can't add one thing to what's been done for you. I did it all while I was dying. Rest in your faith, my peace will come to you. For when I hear the praises start, oh, my child, I want to rain upon you. Blessings that will fill your heart, for I see no stain upon you. Because you are my child, and you know me. Oh, to me, you're only holy, nothing that you've done will remain only what you do for me. You have been washed and cleansed. There is no stain on the people of God because of Jesus Christ. That's the truth. You are a new creation in Christ. That's the truth. Believe it. That's why we praise. <laughs> Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb would rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. Counselor, Comforter, Yeah. 
that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. Have a seat. I almost panicked. I set the coffee on the other side of the podium. I didn't see it. All is well. God is good. We're going to open up to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, please. <clears throat> Starting at the 18th verse. Now, we've been going through promises of God um, over the last, uh, whatever it is, seven weeks or better now, uh, nine weeks now, the beginning of this year. And... Um, we're coming to a close here today with this, this kind of final promise, and you'll hear about it, because we're coming into, into Holy Week. And so um, we're going to read 1 Corinthians, and then I'm going to do that kind of setup that I've been doing to kind of talk about where we've been. It's the last time you're going to hear it. But for those of you who have not been around, you'll get an opportunity of what's been going on. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is is stronger than human strength. All right, let's pray. Mm, Father, thank you for the gift of your word. And we pray, Father, that as we open it up this morning, as we talked about earlier, as we brought to you before in our prayers, we know that, Lord, that when you pour your spirit out, you give us understanding of scriptures, that you open up our hearts and our minds to understand what your word is saying. And we know that it's alive, that it goes to work on us, that it interprets us. It's not us about, about us interpreting you, but about you interpreting and remaking us. That's finally what it happens when we read your word. You, you work on our hearts. You transform our lives. And so, Father, we pray that you would pour your spirit out and do that again this morning. Go to work, Father. Do your surgery. Do your encouraging. Strengthen us in faith, Father. We ask for an outpouring of the Spirit. Empty me of myself and fill us, Lord, with your Spirit, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength. You are our salvation. And all God's people say, all right, this is the last time I'm going to kind of frame up where we've been so uh, we can kind of understand what's going on today. From the beginning of the year, we've been talking about New Year's resolutions, if you haven't been around. New Year's resolutions, but not our resolutions, not the resolutions that we are making, but the resolutions that God makes to us, the resolutions of God's promise to God's people, the promises of God. And we've been doing this as a way to kind of ground ourselves because our life has to be grounded not in our resolve, but in God's resolve, God's promises to us. And these are the things that we stand on. This is our firm foundation. So we've been reminding ourselves of our ground underneath our faith and underneath our lives Because it's by these promises, the promises of God, that we move from a life where we strive to make a difference in the world to a life, right? We we move from a life that we where we strive to make our mark in the world to a life that is marked in order to make a difference in the world for Jesus' sake. God's promises define us, God's promises fill us, and God's promises send us. So the first six weeks of this year, we talked about kind of personal promises that God makes to each of us, right? A new you, a living hope, rest for the soul, the forgiveness of sins, eternal life, abundant life. And those were the personal promises from God to you and to me. 
But they were never meant to hoard. Those weren't promises that we're meant to kind of keep and hoard and, and kind of keep to ourselves. Because as we receive those promises, empowered by those personal promises, what does God do? God turns us to the world. And as he turns us, as God turns us to the world, God pours out not just personal promises, but promises that guide our work out there in the world. So two weeks ago, we heard about God's promise of purpose. That as we turn and we receive these personal promises, and as we turn into the world, we have a purpose, a new purpose from God. And in that purpose, in that new purpose from God, we are grounded and we are gifted and we are going. Ephesians chapter 2 says that we were created in Christ Jesus for good works. That there's a purpose to the life and the thing that God is doing in us, that he sends us out there to do good works. And last week we discovered that as we turn to the world and our neighbors, not only do we have the promise of a new purpose, a real amazing purpose, but we also have the promise of power. The promise of power, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the power of God at work in you and me. The gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's by the Holy Spirit that we have the power to comprehend. We talked about that earlier in the prayer. The power to comprehend what Scripture says. We have the power that makes us confident and bold. We're not timid. And by the promise of power, we are capable. We can accomplish whatever God sets out before us by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us. We are capable. Remember last week we ended with the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. Come on, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us, Romans chapter 8, verse 11. So now today, the promise of purpose and the promise of power, the last two weeks, all lead us into this last promise that we're going to talk about this year, is the promise of our proclamation. Promise of proclamation. We have something to say to the world. Amen? It was a little weaker than I like. We have something to say to the world. And so as we do that, we're going to have three words that kind of guide us today as we look at this, as we look at the power of our proclamation. And the three words are madness, message, and mandate. And so you can see that on the back of of your insert there. You can take sermon notes if you like. The madness of what we proclaim, the message of our proclamation, and the mandate that God gives us to tell the world about Jesus. So first of all, let's define proclamation. The definition of proclamation is a public announcement, a public announcement, especially one dealing with a matter of great importance. Well, when we tell others about Jesus, we are sharing a message of great, immense proportion. (laughs) In Jesus, we're saved. Amen? Amen? In Jesus, we have been reconciled to God. Our our relationship to God has been healed. We are children of the living God. Amen? In Jesus, we have the victory over sin, death, and the devil. Amen? This is a matter of great importance that we proclaim this message that God has given us. Is there anything greater than that? So what we proclaim, what we say, has huge implications for everyone who hears it. That's why we are public about it. That's why we speak to people about Jesus. And we have to stop here, and we have to remember this, because I think the devil loves to use this. The devil, I hear this from time to time in the culture, and even in the church. When I talk to people, they'll say things like, you know, faith is a private thing. I think the devil loves it when we say faith is a private thing. Because what does that keep you from doing? Sharing your faith. If your faith is private, then, then I'm not going to step out with it because I don't, I don't want to offend anybody. But that is not what the reality of faith in Jesus Christ looks like. Faith is personal. That's where the devil loves to twist it. You have a personal relationship with the living God. He knows you intimately. He saves you particularly. In particular ways, he gives you strength for what you need in very specific ways. You have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But that does not mean, don't let the devil twist it to say, so be private about it. You have a personal relationship with Jesus, but we are called to live out our faith publicly. Amen? We are called to live it out in public ways. We are called to speak to people. It means that none of us are exempt from proclaiming, from telling this message of great importance to people. So here's where we find our first word for today. The promise that God gives us for our proclamation about our proclaiming is this. It is madness. 
It's sheer insanity. Let's look at chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, verse 18. Chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, verse 18. For the message, message I'm going to mess this up a lot. There's a lot of S's. So I'm, I'm tongue-tied a little bit today. The message of the cross, it says, verse 18, chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, is what? Foolishness. The message of the cross is foolishness. The word of the cross, some of you might say, is folly. But here's the thing. The root word here in Greek, the root word for that folly or foolishness in Greek, you know what it is? It's moria. Moria. It's where we get the word moron from. It literally means stupidity. So when we say, it says in Scripture, the word uh, of our proclamation is, is folly, it's really being fairly nice about what it's saying. What it actually says in Greek is it's absolute moronic stupidity to those who are perishing. To those who are perishing. To the world. Our proclamation is madness. And I'm going to talk about two reasons why our proclamation is madness. First of all, because God uses us. <laughs> Come on, you and me. That's the first reason that our proclamation is absolute madness, because God uses us, right? God uses us. The second is because of what we are saying, the message that we bring. And that's actually the second point that we're going to get into, because those two things are kind of tied. The madness, the folly of this proclamation is also tied to the message of what we bring. So we'll get into that in a minute. But first of all, let's look at verse 21. 1 Corinthians 1, chapter 20, chapter 1, verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know God, God was pleased through the, what? Foolishness, the moronic stupidity of what we preach to save those who believe. To save those who believe. God uses our words to save others, us, us, you and me. Shouldn't God use some more capable people? Shouldn't, shouldn't God look for people without, without pasts or without any issues? I'm assuming that everybody in here has issues. Is that a correct assumption? Everybody's got a past that they're not like pounding up on the door and going, hey, look. I, well, wouldn't God want to use people without pasts or, or issues? People more capable? Well, let's look at the method of God's madness throughout Scripture. Who did God use throughout the, 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 the witness of Scripture? When we go in the Old Testament, it's a mess. God uses incredibly broken people to bring his message of hope and life to the world. Right? We get Jacob, he's a con man. We get Moses, he's a murderer. We get Jeremiah, he's only a boy. And then we get to the New Testament, and Jesus picks 12 disciples. And these aren't the brightest and the best bulbs in the bunch. Half the times, they're just kind of bumbling. Denying, betraying, right? And that's just a few. We could go through a long list of men and women. In fact, we could go through the genealogy of Jesus and look at this long list of men and women that don't, aren't overly qualified or capable, and some even hostile to God at first. But that's who God has chosen to be proclaimers of his good news that's found in Jesus Christ. It's madness. God even uses somebody like this guy named Saul. Remember Saul? Saul, a persecutor and a killer of Christians. Not only was he kind of like, yeah, I'm not really into Jesus. He was totally against Jesus. And he uses Saul to become a, a, a proclaimer of Jesus' life. Look at Acts chapter 9, we're just look briefly at that story of, of, of Saul, where he goes from Saul to Paul. Saul, and if you look in, you don't have to do this now, but if you look at chapter 7, the end of chapter 7, Saul is holding the coats of the people that stone the apostle Stephen. So Saul is there holding the coats as people stone Stephen. You look at chapter 8, the beginning of chapter 8, it says Saul is given the authority to go out and persecute Christians. Same thing at the top of chapter 9, where we are. Meanwhile, Saul is breathing out murder and threats against the Lord's disciples. But on the way to Damascus, he suddenly meets the Lord. And the Lord speaks to him and says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Right? And he falls to the ground and there's scales on his eyes. And he says, who are you, Lord? 
chapter uh, 9 of Acts, verse 5 and 6. I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. Now get up and go to the city and you'll be told what you must do. And there in the city he meets a guy named Ananias. And Ananias is a disciple, is, is a follower of Jesus. And Ananias doesn't want anything to do with Saul because he knows who Saul is, right? He's a persecutor of the church. Why would I go to find Saul? And, but the Lord says in a vision, go and find this man Saul. Go. And, and look in verse 13 there. He says, Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done for, to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest and call on that any who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And when you get down, and you go down to chapter one, uh, this same chapter 9, you get into chapter 9, verse 20, 21, 22, immediately Saul is in the synagogues preaching Jesus to people. And, and, and the church is just, they're, they're freaked out. They're like, what is going on here? This, is this guy for real? But look in verse 22 here. Yet Saul grew more and more powerful, and he baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. By proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Paul would go on and write much of the New Testament. Much of the New Testament. So what does that mean for us? Why did I bring up the, the, the issue of Saul? who is now Paul, the Apostle Paul, writing the Bible, much of the, much of the New Testament. Well, in this time and place, right now, in the history of the world, do you know who God has chosen to be proclaimers of his love, grace, forgiveness, and promises? You're like, let's go, honey. Gonna go, let's go back out to the car. You. Not because you're super capable, not even because right now maybe you're not even very faithful. Maybe you're like Saul, you're here kind of out of spite. But I believe God brought you here today to make you and to turn you into a proclaimer of truth for the world. God is choosing you and me today to bring his love and his grace. Anyone with ears today to hear, let them hear. God has chosen you as his proclaimer of love and grace through Jesus. A few weeks ago, some of you know I was down uh, in Northfield doing a, a show with a, an old band that I was in. Haven't, we've done three shows in 30 years, so that was kind of interesting. Um, uh, went, went, it went great, and we went into the recording studio. That was really, really fun to do that again. Um, and um, while I was down in Northfield, where I went to college and where we were doing this concert, I ran into somebody at night. We were out uh, after, we, after we were uh, practicing and another friend of ours was playing a concert, so we were out at this concert. And I ran into somebody I haven't seen in 25 years. Ran into this guy, I had not seen him. Walked in, I, had, I didn't even know he was gonna be there. I had not seen him in 25 years. I walked in, there he was. And so we stood, we hugged and we, you know, hey, and you know, talking. And at some point, he, he goes, he says to me, uh, now he goes, um, now, now, you, now you're a pastor, right? And there was kind of these question marks in every kind of word that he said to me, right? Now, you're a pastor, right? Right, you know? And I go, yeah, yeah. I said, you know, I have, I'm a pastor of this awesome church in Marshall down in the southwestern part of the state. And then, and then he kind of looks at me out of the corner of his eye, and, he, and, he, and he, I had my hair down at the time, you know, so I was, I was incognito. So I had, my, I, had my, I had my hair down. And he kind of looks at me out of the corner of his eye, and, and he, goes, um, he goes, what kind of pastor are you? You see, if God can use me and my past and my issues, and God can use Saul and Saul's past and Saul's issue, there is nobody beyond God's reach. There is nobody here today that God is not going to use to bring his glory and to proclaim his truth. So the first part of the madness of how God chooses to proclaim the good news who is uh, is, is who God chooses to do it. That's you and me. The second part of the madness is the, mad, is the message itself. This is the second word for today. The message of our proclamation. Verse 18, look at that. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. It is foolishness to the world. The very nature of the message is crazy. And what is that message? Look at Romans. We're going to be in Romans a little bit. So if you get to Romans, you can kind of put a bookmark there. Romans chapter 5. Get to Romans chapter 5, verse 6. What is the message? What is this crazy message that we're proclaiming? Romans chapter 5, verse 6. 
Paul, who we just said was Saul, wrote this book. You see, Romans 5, 6, at the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, even though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Son of God lays down his life for you and me. God Perfect, totally sovereign, needs nothing. There at the beginning of the world, all things created through him and for him, lays down his life for you and me so that we can live. (laughs) The death of Jesus brings about our life, eternal and abundant. Death brings life, strength in weakness. It is nonsense to the world. It is absolute madness to those who are perishing. But as we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, God chose to make foolish the wisdom of the world. The world will not know God through its wisdom. God ensured that. We will not come to the Lord through our wisdom. Remember last week when we talked about, uh, about the promise of power, the gift of the Holy Spirit, how through the Holy Spirit we have the power to comprehend. We've talked about that again today a little bit. We've, the, power, the Holy Spirit gives us the power to comprehend who God is and where God is in our life, and what God is up to in us and around us. That comes through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Trusting in Jesus, faith in Jesus, is a movement of the Holy Spirit. It happens by the heart in faith, not the head in smarts. Not only is the message crazy so that God is dying for me so that I might live. That is just, boing! God also makes it ridiculously simple to be saved, and for us to save others. How many of us love to make Christianity really complicated and have all sorts of stuff? It's really simple. It's so simple, it's almost moronic. It's almost foolish. It's so simple. Look at Romans chapter 10. I told you to keep yourself in Romans there. Romans chapter 10, verse 8. Romans 10, verse 8. But what does it say? It says, The word is near you. It is, it is in your mouth and in your heart. Remember, we have something to proclaim. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. And here it is. Listen. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your hearts that God raised him from the dead, you, what does it say? You will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you professed faith and are saved. Scripture says anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for, he, for there is no difference between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's it. Are you kidding me? That's it. Believe in the promise and confess it with your mouth. Saved. Saved. See, if you've been seeking God, but you don't know if you're saved, I want you to listen to my voice. God loves you. Your sins have been forgiven for Jesus' sake. John 3.16, the God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. Listen to this. Confess that it's true with your lips. Lord, I believe that you died for me, that my sins have been taken care of by Jesus, that I am forgiven by the blood of Jesus. I I believe that. I confess that with my lips. And And I believe it not because I can prove it or I know it with my head, but because God said it and it's promised. It's promised in here. I believe it in my heart. Boom. Saved. Here's a, here's a great gift. Faith is not a feeling. It's not a feeling. Faith is not, a intellectual, it is not an intellectual game. Faith is trusting in the promises that God makes. That's it. When we trust in the promises God makes and we confess it with our lips, we are saved. We are saved. It is madness. And, and, and if, if you don't know if you're saved, I want to invite you to talk to me after the service or give me a call and we'll pray together. We'll talk about what this new life looks like for you. But it is madness, this message, because through it the wisdom of the world was brought down and made nothing so that the wisdom of God might rise. 
1 Corinthians 1, 21, 20 and 21. The wisdom of the world is made foolish, right? 20 and 21. Where is the one who is wise? For since the wisdom of God, the world didn't know, did, through its wisdom did not know God, God was pleased with the foolishness of what we preached to save those who believed. Jesus died for you. And He loves you. Now, here comes the mandate. Here comes the mandate. We believe in the madness of the message. Now we're called to step out and just speak it. That is the mandate. God says, speak up. Look at Romans chapter 10 again where we just were. When you go on through that, Romans chapter 10, and I said right at 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then look what it says. But how are they going to call on the one in whom they don't believe in? And how can they believe in one that they've never heard about? And how can they hear about someone if no one's preaching it to them? And how can anyone preach unless someone is sent? As it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. We have a mandate from God to proclaim what God has done for us. God tells us to bring the good news that is Jesus Christ to the world. Now, if you need to hear Jesus say it, you can go home tonight and you can read Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20, where Jesus says, Go there, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore, go, preach, baptize, teach, go tell others. It never says in Scripture that you need to understand everything theologically. Can we get an amen? Can I get a praise the Lord for that? Right? That somehow you have to, through dogmatics and theology, describe how salvation in Jesus Christ happens. That is not what God is asking of you. God says, tell them what I've done. Tell them who I am. It just says, go, talk about what I've done for you, and let them know what I can do for them. Share the good news, because the good news is Jesus. Amen? And it's really good news. Pastor Dave, um, that is not my gift. I'm, I'm, I, I can do serving really well. That's where my gift lies. I just am a behind-the-scenes person. Serving is real. I think a lot of guys would like to say that. I just like to serve. Yep, I understand that. And I understand that some of us have the spiritual gift of service. We're awesome at behind-the-scenes stuff. And maybe we're intimidated by telling or praying or inviting or even saying the name of Jesus. I get that somehow that can be a little prickly at times, right? I get that. But I also think that sometimes we use that as an excuse not to tell others about Jesus or speak the name or pray for them. Hate to break your bubble. I think sometimes we, the devil loves to use that as an excuse. Like, well, that's not my gift. I'm not going to say anything right now. Or I'm not going to bring up the name of Jesus. But we all, every one of us, must understand that our message is urgent and that others need to hear what God has given us to say. Remember what I said earlier, that God chooses you and me to save others through this foolish message? We have to say it. Have you ever been talking with somebody who's really going through it? You're just kind of sitting with them and listening, and, and, and whether it's they're worried or they're lost, and, and whatever they're going through, they're just really going through it. And in your heart, you keep feeling this like, boink, 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 boink. Has that ever happened to anybody? This poke? And you have this sense that, that you should say something, that there's, that there's, this, that there's a, a little bit of a weight pressing on you, that you should tell them about your hope, or maybe that you should pray for them, or you should name the name of Jesus and offer God's love and grace to them, and, or maybe that you should invite them to a Bible study or invite them to church, but there's something that just kind of keeps boink, 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 boink. I'll do it again, boink. That's the Holy Spirit. That is God saying, tell them, tell them, tell them. Anybody left that kind of situation, not said anything, and then you like for a week you're like, why didn't I say something? The door was wide open. God is going, I've put you in that conversation for a reason. I need you to open up your mouth and tell them about Jesus. Here's the deal. 
I don't want you to get overwhelmed by hearing this, that God is calling you to do this. Don't start feeling nervous or worried, because look at what God has promised about our proclaiming. I'm going to give you Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 and 11. You can underline these words if you've got them in your Bible, or just circle them. Isaiah 55, verse 10 and 11 says this. Farmers, you'll understand this. As the rain and the snow come down, Isaiah is in about the middle of the Bible. It's after Psalms and Proverbs. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and don't return to it without watering the earth, in other words, the rain comes down and does what it's supposed to do, it makes buds flourish and so that it yields the seed for the sower and bread for the eater. Come on, farmers, we know this, right? That's what, that's what happens, right? It says, just like that rain, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You see, it isn't your word that you're speaking. God's put it in your mouth. The word of life through Jesus Christ. What we proclaim is God's word. And if he's nudging you to say it, he'll give you the words that are needed. In fact, Mark chapter 13, verse 11, talks about being in a really bad situation where you're dragged before kings and councils, where you maybe been beaten, where you're, you're asked to give an account. And, and Jesus says in, in, in Mark 13, verse 11, he says, don't even worry about what you're going to say then. Don't get anxious even in the midst of real persecution. Because I'm going to give you those words. I'm going to give them to you. Remember, this isn't, it isn't you that have to do the work. You don't have to do the work of saving. That's God's work to save, amen? We just proclaim what he has promised and what he's done for us. He does the rest. We have the easy end of the deal. We got the easy end of the deal. I mean, a little embarrassment, maybe an awkward conversation, a sideways look from somebody at the next table, whatever. I mean, no biggie. Jesus did the real work. He bled, died, was crucified. That's the real work. We get the good stuff. He carried the sins of the entire world, and we get to proclaim salvation, love, and hope. We get the good stuff. Maybe a sideways glance? Come on, guys. We are promised that our proclamation will do amazing things in the life of the people that we speak Jesus into. This isn't a sermon written simply for you to ponder. I hate to tell you. God didn't lay this on my heart so you could go home and just kind of think about it. I want you to. But I believe that God gave it to me because there are people he is trying to reach in your life. People you know that he wants to speak with. And I also know that God wrote this sermon for me. That there are people in my life that I believe God wants me to talk to. And so I'm going to pray for God to use me, in, use me in their life. I'm going to pray that God will open up doors for me to have conversations with them. I'm going to pray that God will fill me with a boldness so that when those doors open, that I step through them. And then I'm going to pray that he gives me words so that as I speak, they're, they're the right words in the right way, uh, in, in the right attitude, with the right kind of temperament and the right kind of temperature, that, that, I, that I do it in such a way that draws people in, not turns people off. How about you? Could it be that this sermon was written by God for you because there is someone that God is trying to reach and he needs you? He needs your voice. He needs your story to reach them with the message of Jesus' love and salvation. Wouldn't that be insane? <laughs> Almost moronic? If God used you and me? And this crazy message to save? It's madness. But we have a message and a mandate from God. Will you join me in telling the lost and the broken and the defeated and the doubting and the dying about Jesus Christ? See, I believe in God's promises, every single one that we've talked about these last nine weeks. I believe that they are absolutely true. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, all God's promises are yes in Jesus, amen? I believe that they're all true. And I believe all of them, even this one, that God promises to use your and my proclamation to save. It's so urgent. So let's go. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for um, using this.
crazy way, this mad way of using us with an incredibly simple God believing in you is it. Salvation through Jesus Christ in faith and salvation happens. And you use people to speak the Word to other people. It's just an incredible thing, Lord. You promise it. And so, Father, may we receive the, this promise this morning. And, and as we step out, I pray that You would bring opportunities for us. Nudge us by Your Spirit. And then open the door and then give us a boldness to step out and then give us words to speak that we might be encouragers, proclaimers of Your love and Your grace of salvation through Jesus Christ. Father, come. Pour Your Spirit into us. Use us. We ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, We, uh, we worship God now using um, our tithes and our offerings, but before we get there, I just want to welcome any visitors or guests, and I've got just a couple of things to say to visitors or guests that are here this morning. First of all, welcome. We're really glad that you're here. If you are um, looking for a church home, we'd invite you to pray about that. We have a, a welcome center right out the church doors and a hard left, and there's a blue sign and a kind of a higher top table with somebody standing there or a countertop, and they'll let you know a little bit about the church. Um, we're not the only gig in town. There's other churches. But if God is calling you here to proclaim with us the love of Jesus Christ to the world, then we'd, we would be thrilled and, and blessed by, by your gifts and presence with us. As we receive this morning's offering, I want you to know as a guest or a visitor, if you're a guest or a visitor, your presence here is offering enough. Thank you for being with us. We're blessed that you're here, and we pray that you're being blessed by being with us. For those of us where this is our worshiping community, we worship God now with our tithes and our offerings. We're going to sing an old song, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. Together, let's confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Find that on the screen above. I believe in God.
He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Um, Baptism is uh, a gift that God uh, gives uh, to us. It is a a gift and a work that God does in our life, um, in the life of his people. We uh, are a church that baptizes infants and baptizes adults. We uh, um, don't make people baptize infants. We we like to baptize infants, but we'll baptize uh, whoever. But we do believe this, that it's a gift from God, that God's promises are involved in baptism because Scripture talks about that. But we also don't believe that it's a silver bullet, that we've got to teach faith, especially if we're going to be uh, baptizing infants, then we've got to be able to pass faith on because it's faith that receives the promises of baptism. It's faith that claims what's what's happening in baptism. In, In this gift that God gives us, right, he frees us from sin and death by joining us to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 6, 3-5 through 5 says, All of us were baptized into Christ Jesus. We were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. And I like the water to go everywhere. <laughs> because we have an abundant God. He's not chintzy. It's not metering out little things. He pours things out, and it gets all over. His grace is just extravagant, right? It's amazing what God does. And throughout Scripture, water has always been, in Scripture, a sign of rebirth, of new life, of cleansing, of forgiveness. It's a symbol of that, and so we claim that. In this baptism, God gives us, as it says in Romans chapter 6 that I just read, that we're united into into Christ's death, but also united into his resurrection, And so we're raised with Christ. That's the promise. Our Heavenly Father gives us this gift. We're born, we're reborn children of a fallen humanity, from a fallen humanity into the waters of baptism, reborn children of God and inheritors of eternal life through faith as we receive the promises in faith. By water and the word, we're made members of one another. We're united together. And it's through this uniting and through the work of the church that we grow in faith, love, and obedience to the will of God. You know, in Mark 10, Jesus is, is uh, people are, are, are all around Jesus and children are coming and the disciples get all ticked off that the, all these kids are running up. And Jesus really rebukes the disciples and says, let the children come to me. Don't stop them for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. I truly, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. He took them up in his arms and he blessed them. So Kevin and Ashley, as Keaton sponsors, uh, will you uh, sponsor him now and into his adult life? If so, respond, uh, we will. We will. Uh, I charge you then to remember Keaton in your prayers. I kind of mentioned earlier, like the, the sum of uh, Godparent sponsorship can kind of be summed up with, if you're not praying for him, I don't know who is. And so just to be holding Keaton in prayers, but also to live lives that Keaton can look to and, and have a sense of what it means to be faithful. Because like I said, it's baptism is a gift from God, but then we receive the gifts through faith. And so it needs, we need to encourage and strengthen Keaton's faith to receive the promises that come through baptism. And so that's part of your role that you have in his life. And uh, Kyle and Mallory, do you desire that uh, Keaton be baptized this morning? If so, respond, I do. We, do. we do. Then I charge you to diligently and faithfully teach him the Ten Commandments, the Creed, the Lord's Prayer, kind of the basics of faith, and to put in his hands the Scriptures so that he can have access to understanding who God is by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in his life, and then bring him around the church and bring him around people that are going to encourage him in faith and strengthen him in faith so that he can receive these promises. And uh, we do a little Keaton. I receive the sign of the cross on your head and the sign of the cross on your heart, right? to be strengthened in faith, patient in suffering, and that through faith that you can live with Jesus and be with Jesus all the days of your life. That's our prayer. So come on over, Keaton. Come on over. You can just kind of hold him down like that. We'll see how that goes. Keaton, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There you go, buddy. There we go. Oh, there you go. 
Keaton, Matthew, child of God, you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ. Let's pray. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks through Jesus' death and resurrection, and by faith, you free us from the power of sin and raise us up to a new life. By the Holy Spirit, which you pour out on Keaton, increase in him the gift of grace, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence. Look with kindness on Keaton and Mallory and Kyle, the sponsors. Make them teachers and examples of righteousness and strengthen them in their own faith so that they may share eternally with Keaton the salvation that you give through Jesus Christ. And all God's people say, Amen. All right, well, we got... We've got a, uh, a candle that you can use to kind of celebrate the, this day in the future to kind of remember. I'm going to just give that to you um, as a way to kind of say uh, also that as sponsors and as parents to remind Keaton throughout his light to life to let his light so shine before others that they see his good works and give glory to his Father in heaven. It's a reminder of that, but it's also just something we can, you can use to celebrate the day of baptism and the, his faith as his faith grows. Um, we also have this, this is, uh, we'll see if that even works. I'm just going to, just something that the congregation wraps him in. Oh, hey, buddy. How you doing? He's really leery of me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, we, uh, we bring him into the, into, the, into the life of the congregation and down into your midst because um, we have a responsibility to teach Keaton faith because we can't baptize without teaching faith because it's faith that claims the truth of baptism. Whether you're an adult or whether you're a kid. So we have a responsibility as a congregation to, to teach the faith so that he can claim the promises of baptism. And we lay him in the arms of somebody in the congregation. Sean, you're the man today. Um, into, the, into the arms of a, of a member of the congregation to say, Keen's been placed in our arms and we have a responsibility before, before God to, to be a congregation of truth uh, that teaches life. There, see, I better take him back, Sean. I can see Let's welcome Keaton. Into, there's words up on the screen, and then Mallory, you can go get him before Sean pinches him again. Uh, let's welcome. We welcome you into the Lord's family and into this church. We receive you as a member of the body of Christ, a child of the same Heavenly Father, and a worker with us in the kingdom of God. Let's give thanks for Keaton's life. You guys can go down off it too. Please stand. <laughs> Here I am before you.
with arms wide open to the one, the Son, the everlasting God, the everlasting God. So I shout out your name from the rooftops I proclaim I am yours. I am 